All right, friends, we are back from CES, and uh, it was an amazing experience. Yeah, it was uh, really interesting. We had a lot of meetings, yeah. um, and uh, it was good. It was productive. Yeah. Thank you for the friendly comments and, and also for uh, the encouragement you guys gave. Uh, we really, not only speaking on the panel was awesome experience, but during the time while we were down there, uh, we were able to uh, really connect with a lot of different people, um, get some really good perspective that we're going to be sharing with you, and uh, hopefully help you guys uh, form your remarks on Remote ID. Yeah. So uh, a few videos ago, we kind of uh, asked you guys to kind of withhold comment for, ne for now. There's a 60-day comment mm -hmm. period from when the Remote ID NPRM was released. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that we finally have kind of um, talked to enough people and gotten enough feedback yeah. that we can make some recommendations for how you guys can make the most effective comments. I realize it's really difficult to kind of stare at a blank text box and like come up with something that sounds meaningful and uh we're right there with you guys but we're we're, we're kind of at the point where we're going to be forming our comment for ftca mm -hmm. which will be a little bit different than your average um kind of recreational pilots comment but we think mm -hmm. that we have kind of put together a framework um for your average um, recreational user that is going to be the most effective in kind of getting through to the FAA on what the issues are, what their proposed rulemaking, and what the recommendations would be so that the FAA can fulfill their mandate in a way that is the least burdensome possible to all of the hundreds of thousands, if not you know millions of people out there flying every day. Yeah, and, and framework is a really good way to say it. Uh, one thing we want to encourage you guys to please do not do is copy and paste. We've seen other organizations saying we have this response here that we would like you guys to use and copy and paste this and put this up. Basically, that'll make your vote count as one, and all it does is just kind of bolster the organization that's asking to do it. We need to make sure that every single voice is heard individually with the specific facts on how they're going to be affected negatively. Um, the FAA needs to know that because one thing that we found out really quickly was we were terribly misrepresented when uh, the rule makers proposed this new rule. Um, they have no clue what our core community fly. They have no clue how we build. They have no clue about what the aircraft are capable of. And it was really alarming when we were talking to different people. We're in the middle of CES and they're looking around with all these drones that can go into mines and all these different, you know, capabilities with sensors on sensors, you know, internet of things. And they're like, well, why can't you guys do this? Well, it's because they don't know. So it's not, um, encouraging thing is it's not uh, malicious, it's ignorance. And we need you guys to help educate them on exactly what we do, why we do it, and how this will negatively affect it in your own words. It has to be personal, but it cannot be emotional. Yeah, and one thing I'm going to interject too, um, it's really, there's really nobody to blame, but they're to, from what I got from talking with the FAA and different representatives at CES, um, their best understanding of a hobbyist as it stands is either a DJI user or a tr more traditional hobbyist. And it makes sense because they have been the most represented in some of these, um, in some of these uh, gatherings over the past couple months. Uh, but in terms of like what's going on at Flight Fest, what's going on in our community, the modern mainstream DIY hobbyist out there that's making stuff in their basement with their kids, yeah. they're just kind of uh, not aware that that's actually going on. So it's really important if you're one of those people to actually uh, take the notes from these guys and make that comment. So, so we'll kind of put some more specifics in the description or just kind of uh, um, kind of the framework that we've been talking about. But we figured it would be helpful just to kind of give some examples. Yeah. So the the kind of the way that we've been thinking about it is um, say you know I am this type of pilot. Um, this is the type of aircraft I fly. Um, and like, I think that even getting specific is helpful. So saying, um, I'm a hobbyist, I fly for fun. Um, my main airplane is a tiny trainer or is a P and P airplane or whatever it is that you fly. And, uh, I think that even helping like describing it a little bit would be helpful. Yeah. Like for, I keep using the tiny trainer as an example kind of internally, just because it's slightly over the 250 gram limit. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a, um, as an innocuous of an aircraft as you can probably fly. <laughs> um, and uh, it's um, something that would be required by the remote ID um, proposal to have a broadcast remote ID solution and a network ID sol solution. So I'm thinking about like schools yeah. that are flying, you know, 50 tiny trainers, you know, out on their soccer field. And it's like, all of these are gonna have to have like this technology put into it, unless we can kind of help 
um, the rule makers understand that just like it's not just you know more you know ready to go aircraft or that are you know flown at you know an exclusive model field, and it's not just um, ready to fly you know drones that you can get that you take out of the package and it's pretty much ready to go. There's a lot of space in between. There's a big space in between, and we feel like that that is a space that has been kind of underrepresented and we need your guys' help to help that space be better represented, and particularly through these comments. So I went off a little bit tangent no, no, there, but. Yeah, in, in this case, and, and in the reason why we brought up Tiny Trainer, how it was built, the materials, everything, uh, during the CES panel was for that exact reason. It was to educate people because we realized quickly that we gotta shape what people's minds are around the hobby. Um, to what you said, you're absolutely right. Like, the more accurate you can represent what you do personally. So here is my flying field, here is my um, aircraft that I fly. Um, a couple of really big things that you've got to focus in on is how the cost of doing this, whether it is the cost of bringing the equipment in or the capability of the airplane to even carry that, even if the cost wasn't a factor, or even for the flying field, if you know, uh, say we're, you know, right here in the US, we have 800,000 active users um, that, that uh, invest in flight tests. If we had those all collapse on current flying fields, there's not a flying field around every corner. There's a distance you have to drive. There's club dues. You've got to become part of a, a CBO like the AMA. You know, so now you have the cost of, say, 70 bucks a year. You have the club dues that could be between 40 and $100 a year. All those things are financially too burdensome to be able to enjoy the hobby, and that is incredibly important for the FAA to know that. And just to clarify, like, is how that kind of interlocks into the propo proposed rulemaking is that there is a... Um, clause for amateur built aircraft, mm -hmm. which is, um, we don't know the precise definition of amateur built yet, um, but the concept is, is that you'll be able to fly amateur built aircraft at a fixed flying site without mm -hmm. any remote ID technology on board. Um, and so kind of the questions that we have is, you know, how do we define a fixed flying site? You know, how do we approve a fixed flying site? So that's why we think it's important for, you know, after you kind of describe the potential consequences, which cost being the, the big headliner there, is that you're also talking about, hey, this is, look, I'm going to describe my dedicated flying site, mm -hmm. which might be a soccer field. It might be your backyard. It might be, you know, a place where you get together, you know, at your friend's house where they have a big spot to fly. That, you know, I think that, the fixed flying site, you know, depending on how it's defined and depending how easily they are approved, you know, I think that that um, is a potential solution. But I think that when you're flying, you know, the type of quote unquote amateur aircraft that we're mm -hmm. flying, there's a lot of different places you can fly them. And there's a yeah. lot of different places that, that people do fly because a proper model field with a runway and a mm -hmm. fence and, a, and a, you know, workbenches, like that's, a hundred miles away for a lot of people. Yeah. So people in, in rural areas and people that um, kind of enjoy their hobby to themselves with their group of friends or whatever, th that's a huge segment of this hobby that we think that the FA is just, just, they don't uh, even know they just, just ignorant yeah. of. Yeah. And so I think yeah. that, you know, describing, you know, enclosing where you fly is going to be really, really important yeah. um, because I, you know, my parents' house is where we have, you know, flight, flight fest. fest. Yeah. And, um, is, is that going to be considered a fixed flying site, you know, or just like the, um, uh, just the people that have a similar, you know, setup in their own backyard, can they make that a fixed flying site? And so I think these are some of the questions that rule makers are going to be forced to think through if yeah. we kind of give, you know, a lot of this context to them. Yeah. It, in a big way and kind of shorten up what you're saying, uh, calling out the cost and calling out the accessibility. So the cost of going to a fixed flying site and the accessibility is going to make compliance impossible. But we can't just tell people that we can't do it and then leave it open-ended. You've got to follow that up with, but here is how it could work, but here is a solution to it. Because if you just name the problem, it's not going to help them form a solution to it. And you trust me, with their track record, you don't want them forming a solution. You need to provide the solution in your own words to how this will be able to make you comply to what they're asking for in the spirit of it uh, without causing uh, undue costs or, or accessibility issues. And, and also, if everyone in the U.S. alone just said, okay, instantly we're going to adopt a flying site locally, the fact is many of these flying sites couldn't hold you. There's way too many people for that flying site to be able to actually hold that. And also, I think it's just kind of a, an unfair burden to, uh, to ask people to you know, join into a flying club 
when all their life they've been safely operating from their own backyard or a soccer field. Um, we need to give the FAA some clear guidelines on how they can basically give us a process to call our backyard uh, a fixed flying site or, or call our local soccer field a flix, uh, fixed flying site. You know, there needs to be a process established that you need to provide for them. That's part of um, why I've been using the term dedicated flying site is because for a lot of people that empty field is their dedicated mm -hmm. flying site. It's not necessarily a fixed site, doesn't necessarily have a runway, doesn't necessarily yeah. cost anything to fly there, but it is a dedicated site is where they fly. And I know that that exists all across the United States. Um, so I guess the... Um, That's my phone. <laughs> I didn't put it on mute. So when it, when it comes to um, uh, what to do, because like the, the conclusion of the comment if it's just, you know, remote ID is a bad idea, we think it's being poorly executed, that's not necessarily helpful. Um, the, the most helpful feedback that you can give is specific criticism and a specific proposal. Yeah. And so kind of, of what we, the biggest issue that we have um, with the remote ID proposal, knowing that in some form remote ID is inevitable, is that um, right now the way the NPR, NPRM is, is, is structured is that uh, if you're not meeting in this uh, amateur built class, if you're not going to be on a dedicated or a fixed flying site, that you will need to have um, remote ID that has a broadcast solution. So that's like a inexpensive, think of it like a beacon. It's kind of like, you know, it's like having telemetry of your battery level and it's just, you know, broadcasting your um, serial number for your aircraft. It's like Bluetooth on your phone. It's like Bluetooth on your phone, very inexpensive, very well-traveled areas as far as technology goes. It's a digital and, packet of information. And then the second one is a network ID solution. So this is where a lot of telecoms will be benefiting because you'll be required to have you know some sort of cellular network um, mm -hmm. attached to your aircraft and so that gets pretty ludicrous when you start thinking about small you know yeah. small amateur aircraft like a tiny trainer. And the biggest issue that we have is that the NPRM does not say broadcast solution or network ID solution. It just says both. Yeah. And to me, that is just like way too burdensome and absolutely ludicrous. And I'm thinking about like a teacher that has an aviation program in their, in their school. They're going to look at that and say, I got to do broadcast and I got to do network and I got to register. And like, this is just too much. I'm out. Yeah. And like, I think that that is a huge consequence of going this way. So I think that um, is kind of where the FTCA is standing is that like we want to see as many ORs mm -hmm. as possible. Yeah. And, and I think that's really helpful for compliance. And you can say that in your comment is that, listen, I want to be able to have like some telemetry thing installed on my airplane where it just kind of, you know, broadcast locally, broadcast my, my, my um, uh, position. And that's going to be yeah. great for amateur aircraft. There's also like app solutions out there Absolutely where you, really can, app solutions, you yeah. can mark on your app and says, hey, I'm going to be flying in this area. I'm going to be here for two hours. And then that kind of gets you into the loop. Or yeah. if you're flying, you know, beyond line of sight and you want to do beyond line of sight operations, hey, I got to get hooked into network ID because I got to have a constant ping of where I'm going to be. Yeah. And so we got to have flexibility. We have to say or, or, or in our execution or this thing is just going to, you know, stack up to a point where people are just be like, I'm out. And no one's perfect either. So, you know, the fact is with flight tests, we celebrate technology, we want to bring it in, and we want to use that technology to impact people in a positive way. So we're not going to turn our back and say, take all technology is bad, it's the drone people, it's the people doing careers out of it. The ultimate villains, frankly, in this, uh, I see a lot of the push from the telecoms. And that's one thing where beyond line to site operations, that's not a burden on them. They, that makes sense for them. But for, uh, for us recreational pilots, having those oars, now the free market will decide what's most economical. Um, the app base and the beacon are both really good, and they both have benefits and they both have drawbacks. Um, you know, what's free today through an app cannot cost, or be free tomorrow, and there's no way of guaranteeing it. Where the beacon is a fixed cost that could hopefully be incorporated in technology, both are viable. Um, both could work. Um, the reality is we can't carve out and have an exemption. They simply won't do it. The Department of Defense and Congress will not let that happen. So we need to give them as many different options. But also, the reason why we said on CES have many different paths to compliance um, was just for that. With having them do and, frankly, the only people winning is the telecoms. And uh, I have, uh, I'm not ready to throw away my phone, but I, I think they are the villain in this. They are the ones saying, everyone has a cell phone currently, let's find other ways that we can make people pay to play. 
and uh, it just kind of boils my blood to be frank with you. The more options we have, the more that the free market can take control and practicality and simplicity can kind of reign in this and uh, that's important. Yeah, I guess the just kind of in concluding, we kind of wanted this to be a, a shorter video, but we do appreciate you guys coming along for the longer form content because yeah. some of the stuff does require some pretty serious context. Mm -hmm. Is that I would just encourage you guys, you know, if there's anybody out there thinking that, oh, the comment period is just a formality, I can't really make a difference or I can't really help with my comment or I'm not going to really say anything that different than anybody else, so I'm going to withhold my comment. Um, I would encourage you guys that the, the volume of comments yeah. and the content of the comments do matter. And it matters from a rulemaking perspective because if there's a critical mass of certain um, issues being raised such as cost or feasibility or compliance, like uh, response is required in the, in the rulemaking. And so yeah. your comments actually are extremely impactful. So please, you know, if you're feeling discouraged of just like, ah, my, my thoughts don't matter, I promise you that they do. Yeah. So we'd encourage you guys to kind of look in the description. We've kind of laid out in a little bit more concise manner, kind of our, yeah. um, our framework. Um, but we would really encourage you. Right now there's about 6,000-ish uh, comments at the time of recording this mm -hmm. video. And uh, I know that partially is that because a lot of people, including ourselves, have been, you know, encouraging to withhold your comment until we can get um, the best possible response together. But to me, that just seems insanely low. Well, yeah. And, and, and we really need to pump those numbers up. I think you guys are just doing exactly what we asked you to do. Hold off on the comments until there's more context. So uh, I think 6,000 right now, as long as it doesn't stay that way, <laughs> that just means you guys are being awesome and, and really putting a lot of trust in and, and all the people saying, wait, make a formed argument. Um, there's one thing also I want to add. You can, you can add a PDF as this. And hmm. really, a picture is worth a 1,000 words. When we were talking to different people, we were literally pulling out our cell phones and showing them pictures of families flying together. We were showing them pictures of our airplanes. We were also showing our background in general aviation, um, just to kind of like make that connection. The beautiful thing about this community is those pictures speak so much and so loudly. So if you guys are willing to share uh, in PDF format, when you make your response on PDF, you can upload some pictures to give them context. So they're not only seeing your words, but they're also seeing literally what you're talking about and placing that and getting a better understanding because I cannot stress enough how much that these people that are writing these uh, proposed rules, they have no clue, absolutely no clue. Um, I heard that they're all in you know closed window doors in their own little bubble. And to them, this is a total shock that it wasn't widely received positively. So we need to educate them and pretend that we're talking to someone that's never seen what we do ever before. And um, you know, make your, your, make your thoughts personal, but again, not emotional. You have to announce, communicate the problem. You have to show them you know, accurately what that is, and then you gotta propose a solution. Uh, if you don't have that ability to do so, that's not the best way to sit on it. Uh, one last thing I really wanna focus on is we have uh, an amazing STEM program. This, I think, is a huge asset for the flight test community because uh, we're not just using this as a hobby, as a recreational activity. Uh, we're using this to change people's lives in a way that Congress and the FAA can really wrap their heads around. So for all of you teachers out there, we really need your help in a big way to be part of this response period, but also um, get your superintendents involved. Get um, as high up the chain in the educational platform as you can to make these responses because that comment then doesn't just represent one family, although that's amazing. It represents a school district. It represents a school that is benefiting and flourishing because of that program. And the stories we personally heard uh, from that, I, I think will turn the hearts of anyone, but also uh, no one wants to attack education. No one wants to stifle a child identifying a career path, especially when it goes into aviation. So, um, you know, if you're watching this, I know we're gonna be working with our STEM leaders to, uh, to get that message out too, but if you're watching this and you are connected to the educational programs, that is incredibly important. Also community-based outreach programs too. We have a lot of people doing community projects and stuff where they're bringing kids in off the streets, teaching them the joys of flight. Um, those things need to be communicated and celebrated and they carry a tremendous amount of weight. All right, well, I want to thank you guys uh, for, for watching and uh, please you know, leave here yeah. and leave a comment. And uh, if you are part of a community of people anywhere online that you think that they might care about this, um, we would encourage mm -hmm. you to share this video. Um, and uh, the, the volume of comments really does matter and your comment matters, so thank you. Thanks, guys. 
just one last note, check the description below. We'll kind of put an outline of all of this. I know that they covered a lot and they did a really good job, but just to kind of distill it so you guys know how to comment best, we'll put that all in the description uh, to kind of give you guys an outline of how to structure your comment. So thanks again, guys. We'll see you in the next one.